So welcome. Um, I would like to introduce Kelly. Kelly Murphy is a graduate of the University of North Texas with a master's degree in library science and a graduate certificate in archival management. She holds undergraduate degrees from Baylor University in environmental studies and psychology. She interned with Dallas Municipal Archives where she learned archival practices and gained experience with arrangement and description, creating finding aids, digitizing images, and preservation. Currently, she's employed by Trinity River Authority of Texas, where she's building a functioning records management program and developing a historical and accessible archive. In her free time, she enjoys reading, hiking, camping, and being outdoors, none of which is surprising to me. So Kelly, welcome to the Code Series. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And just as important, tonight we have our interviewer, Wilma Camarillo. And Wilma is a new graduate student at the University of North Texas, pursuing a master's degree in library science with a concentration in archival studies, just like Kelly did. She holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in art history from the University of Houston. During her undergraduate years, she interned at the Blaffer Art Museum on the University of Houston campus assisting curators with research for upcoming exhibitions and participating in studio session workshops. She also served as an instructional assistant during her graduate studies, providing support to students with their coursework and conducting workshops to address course-related questions. Wilma developed a keen interest in archival work while conducting research on her master's thesis. Her thesis focused on punk zines from the late 1970s to the late 1980s in Houston. She collected and analyzed zines from the University of Houston Special Collections and engaged in conversations with several members of the Houston community, community who were part of the punk scene during that period. This was all new to me. Very interesting, Wilma. In her free time, she enjoys drawing, painting, reading, watching historical dramas, and experimenting with baking. So welcome, Wilma, to the Code Series. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. So I'd like to recommend to everybody that uh, right now you put your your view into speaker view. So you're just looking at um, Wilma when she asks a question and Kelly when she answers the question, like they're sitting on a comfortable couch and we're all participating by watching from the audience. I'm also going to turn off my camera and put on my mute. And if you come up with a question during the conversation, feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll get it get to it at the end. All right. So take it away, Wilma. Okay, so my first question for Kelly is, what inspired you to apply for the Master of Science and Library Science program, considering your previous education had been in environmental studies and psychology? And can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, I guess it was around 2019. Um, I was trying to decide what that next stage of life was going to be that next season of life. I have kids that they were approaching middle school. Um, I had been a stay at home mom. I had done a lot of freelance work. So it was deciding what was going to come next. Um, back when I did my undergrad in environmental studies, the pro I was at Baylor, the program that we had, it was a really cool program, but it was very diverse. You took a couple of classes in all kinds of different segments. So it was never concentrated enough to know Yes, this is the thing I want to focus on. So, I mean, I took a class at, I spent time at the zoo. I did a project on, I had a whole lab full of snakes that I took care of. I studied religion, I studied psychology, um, you know, a little bit of everything. And then in, when you realize later, like, what is it that I really want to do? And I think I realized I just really like learning a number of different subjects. So what a better way to go with that than library science, where your job is to learn all kinds of different information. So I think that's kind of the thing that started on that direction um, and realizing, of course, the service that libraries provide to the communities and um, that opportunity to help be an outreach. And that's interesting. And um, why did you choose UNT in particular for the program? Okay, so when I kind of narrowed it down, what I wanted to do, that it was going to be library science, um, then, of course, your next step is to look at what schools are out there. There are only three in the state that are accredited. So that does narrow down the research a little bit. So the next thing that I did was um, I talked to a variety of librarians. 
So my public librarian our, in our city, it was like he was the head of the libraries and the Parks and Recreation Department, which was a really cool job. Um, I talked to a school librarian. Um, I talked to somebody over at UNT in the portal to Texas history. And um, so just kind of get a different feel of, you know, what their educational experience was, that kind of thing. And I think really what sold it for me was my public librarian. Um, because he had been in the field for a long time and he talked about the quality of employees he had over the years that came from the UNT program. Wow, and um, and then you also mentioned in a previous interview that Dr. Larry Enoch had been your first professor and then you'd appreciated his flexibility with his students. And so is there any like memories um, during your time at the program that you'd like to discuss or highlight? Um, yeah, no, that's actually kind of a fun question because I started in January of 2020. So um, that year is all very memorable in lots of ways, but, you know, also kind of a blur. But as far as classes go, um, that first class that I took in addition to Enoch's, you know, that IOP class was um, the special libraries class. And I think it was, of course, I knew there were lots of jobs in the library field besides what we think of when we think of librarian. But I think in that special libraries class, that's really when it kind of hit me to see the people that found something that matched the library side with, with their previous interests, like you being an art history kind of person, like, oh wait, there's a spot specifically for that niche um, right. which I thought was really cool. And then that summer I took um, the, archi uh, the, what is it, archives and manuscripts class, that intro archiving class. And that really, really sold it for me. I liked the, the theory, I guess, between the, um, you know, not picking sides, being neutral, the neutrality versus the activism side and the important role. And then if you look at, you know, again, the misinformation that's happening in our world right now, the attacks on libraries, the attacks on, you know, racial history and um, access to LGBT information for our kids. Like we see our, our public librarians and our school librarians on the forefront of that battle now but then I think about in the future, you know, our archivists looking back and going, how are we recording this history now? How, what's, what is today's story gonna be told in the future? Right, and that's such an important thing too. Um, and so during your time at UNT, you did a practicum at the Dallas Municipal Archives. So can you describe that experience a bit and what you got out of it? Yeah. Um, that was, I really, really enjoyed my practicum. I'm glad that that is a requirement for the program because, um, and I think that's a requirement for a lot of programs now to have an internship that really forces you out into the field. But for me, I did, um, I, I mean, I looked through the list that UNT provided, but I also reached out on Facebook to an arch a local archivist group and just kind of threw it out there. Is there anybody that does something environmental because that was my passion in undergrad and I got a response from John Slate over at um, Dallas Municipal Archives and he's you know that's he's taking care of the entire Dallas city history so he said I don't have anything specifically environmental but what about the Dallas Water Utilities collection um, Dallas Water Utilities was great about sending their old stuff over to the archive after it went through the records management process. And so he had a whole bunch of stuff that was unprocessed. And I said, that sounds like fun to me. Let's all dig through that. So I met with him and the assistant archivist and took a tour. And then when I came in that first day to come to work, um, basically he said, go grab a few boxes and get started. And that was, I thought, to me, that was a defining moment. Like we had just, I had just come out of um, arrangement and description class. So if you, you know, if you've taken that class, you know that there are no right and wrong answers when it comes to arranging. There are good and better answers. So just to grab a few boxes and be trusted to just go for it, you know, and just try your best and see what happens really was a confidence booster to know that, oh wait, we learned this. What we learned was practical. 
we can do this. Um, and so as I went through that process, not only did I get a chance to kind of do some of that stuff on my own, but also learned how to ask for the things that he wasn't necessarily giving me, but you know, he didn't do a lot of digitizing. So I said, well, you show me how to do that. You have a scanner here, show me how to do that. Um, when he, you know, I had a chance to write some finding aids. Wow. Uh, you know, I had a chance to talk to the records management department because it was all in the same room. Um, I had a chance to go out with him in the field. That's when I really realized how important those connections, that community, that networking is, because you can't, you can't manage what people don't give you. So you have to make those connections with the community so that they know that they can trust you and that they will turn your stuff over to you. So I got to do, you know, go to the Majestic Theater and I got to go see the mounted police horses at Fair Park and just some really fun stuff, but it was really diverse, a little bit of a, um, a look at all of the different aspects of that job. And so to kind of like piggyback off of that a bit, um, so how did you become interested in archives and archival management specifically? And maybe this is something that you've already discussed, um, but yeah, like how, how did you get interested in that in particular? I think, oh, like I said before, I think it was with that archives class to get interested in it. And then when you get into a collection, and it can be any collection, I thought it, I thought I would, you know, some people wonder, you know, well, I love this collection if this is not, you know, my my passion. Yeah, yeah, you will. You know, you get in there and I spent an entire day doing research on I think it was like, a, I don't remember, a news program in the 80s or something, you know, mm -hmm. cable TV, like when we brought cable TV to Dallas and I'm like, I could spend days just going down this rabbit hole. So um, I think you can get into any collection and really want to kind of put together those pieces and see that history. So you really learn to love and appreciate the history in your area when you're working around it. And so, um one thing we wanted to ask is, can you give us some background on your current employer? Um, and what is the history, purpose, and mission of the work that they do? Yeah, so I'm with, um, I'm actually in records management and I'm at the Trinity River Authority. And so basically there are a bunch of river authorities. They are quasi-governmental organizations, basically are run by a board of directors that are selected by the governor. So to have a river authority that has to be established by the Senate, Trinity River Authority was created in 1955. So their job is to oversee water supply and water, um, in our case, it's water for uh, purification, wastewater treatment and water treatment. Um, and just to oversee kind of the, the entire basin, which for Trinity River, that starts north of Dallas and that goes all the way down to the Gulf past Houston. So we're looking at, you know, wastewater treatment up here, water supply up here. And then as you go down, we have a lake um, down in Livingston. We operate a dam down there. And then that lake provides water for the city of Houston. So really important work as far as we all need water. And especially where Texas is growing so fast. So to make sure that we have water in the future and clean water is, is crucial. And can you maybe like discuss like the job hunting process after you graduated, like how how grueling was it in terms of like the applications or the preparation and the interviews and then finally getting the job that. Sure. Yeah. So as I was saying, like before, um, you know, we started here, it's really a combination of. A, a big leap of faith and. Um, you know, of course, hard work and just being in the right place at the right time. So while I was in grad school, I was working as a secretary at a church. Um, and when I got to that last semester, I knew I did not want my practicum to be limited to um, hours around work hours. And I know in a lot of cases, that's what people have to do. Um, I was living on school loans. Mm -hmm. And um, some money I had saved up from before. So I quit my job in January before I graduated in May and basically was thought, you know, I've got about eight months of money to live on and that's it. 
Um, and that was a huge leap of faith and a, a, obviously a lot of privilege to be able to do that. But I'm a single mom. So, you know, you've got family relying on you. So to quit a job that's paying to take a chance on a practicum was was a huge deal. But um, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I felt confident that something would show up at the end. So that's where I was headed as I was headed toward graduation. Um, I started seriously looking at jobs probably in March, started kind of applying for things um, as they popped up. Um, keeping an eye on the job boards, of course, LinkedIn, Indeed, um, Southwest Society of Archivists, lots of places that jobs were posted. Um, after graduation, I did go to an archivist conference. It was in Houston that year. And when I got back from that, then I really just started diving into, I applied for I had probably a few dozen places. I got a few initial interviews. And then again, just stroke of luck. One night I was talking on the phone and I'm just scrolling LinkedIn because I'm scrolling while I'm talking on the phone. And I, you know, you're searching for archivists, you're searching for libraries, you're searching for records, anything that seemed kind of related to the field. And I'm like an hour, hour and a half into scrolling, not really paying attention to what I'm doing. And I see this records administrator post pop up and at the Trinity River Authority. And I mean, I knew a little bit about records. Um, I knew that that was, you know, the flip side of the archive coin. They're, you know, they're, they're together, but they're separate. So if you know one, you can learn the other. Um, and I knew a little bit about river authorities from being an environmental student. I knew, you know, the, the importance of having them um, and kind of, you know, the work that they do. So I went ahead and applied for it. Now, when I looked at the, you know, the job description, it did say it required three to five years of records experience. They preferred the CRA or the CRM, the Certified Records Analysis designation. Um, a lot of the things that it said, uh, you know, I didn't have that, but I applied anyway. And I think I, if I remember, I don't even think I told everybody that I was applying because I didn't want, I was excited, but I didn't want to put it out there too much. Um, so again, I had a couple of other interviews and then I got a call from TRA and he did basically that first interview was a phone interval interview. I kind of called it a vibe check. You know, you talk to somebody see if you kind of get along before they really invite you in um, to that formal interview. And then, so he said, you know, I want you to come back next week. And I said, okay, yeah, whenever next week was the 4th of July. So he said, okay, I'll come the day after. And he was like, no, no, take a couple of extra days because I want you to put together a presentation. Uh, do a PowerPoint presentation like you would be leading a training. Now this, that interview style is very common in the academic world. It's not very common in the business world, but that was totally my jam. It was way easier for me to prepare it in advance than it is. I'm terrible with interviews, um, especially when you don't have experience, right? Like, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> nope, I haven't done that. But, um, but you know, he told me what he was looking for. And so I put together the presentation. I spent about seven hours on it because I watched some webinars just to make sure I was using the right terminology um, to get that overview. So I came in, I did the presentation, we had a conversation. Um, and then what I noticed toward the end of the interview that I had never noticed in an interview before was I was relaxed. I was no longer up, you know, up at the table like this. I had sat back, I'd relaxed my posture. I was like, wait, we're having a conversation. And then um, the funny thing was on our way out the door, I came in one way, so there's, our building is crazy. So I went out the other way and he said, you want to see something cool? You like old stuff. You want to see something cool? And I was like, yeah, sure. So he took me out the other way. And that was where our, um, like our specimen cabinet was all the fish, the shells, the, you know, all you know, the different things that they had found in the river and some of the stuff that the environmental team had been working on. And I went, all right, well that, Sounds like, you know, if he's going to stop and say, hey, you want to see something cool? Like, that seemed like a pretty good sign to me. Um, and then luckily I heard back, you know, just two days later with a job offer. So 
again, like it was just perfect timing. Um, and, I, you know, you know, I was very enthusiastic. That was that was at the top of my list of the interviews that I had had in the those few weeks around there. And so it also looks like you were very like enthusiastic about the project. And I think that was probably important as well, especially if, you know, if you're going into something, you have to be enthusiastic about it and want to do it. Definitely. Um, yeah. I would say, yeah. And I, um, and I don't know if you'll get to that. Actually, probably we'll get to a question similar to that later, but I will say, um, I, there were people that had experience that applied. I mean, I know that. And I know he interviewed people that had more experience. And in fact, my first day, you know, he always takes his uh, new employees out to lunch on their first day. And he said, look, I passed people up with way more experience, but no one had the enthusiasm you did. So coming in and being excited and be willing to do something new to be, you know, if I'm willing to do something new, then I can teach them how to do something new and we can all learn it together. Um, and that excitement really helps with the team building. And, you know, if you're excited to be somewhere, people are gonna, you know, play nicer, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, definitely um, that did play a big part. And um, so the next question here is, let's see. We talked about working with the Trinity River Authority. Um, oh, okay, no, that, that was the next question. How has it been working with the Trinity River Th Authority so far and what are some highlights of the job? I have been there a little bit over a year now and I absolutely love it. Like that's, I never imagined coming out of grad school and my first job being the thing. Um, you know, I thought I'd have to bounce around as you do. I mean, lots of jobs like this are contract based or they're short term or, you know, you move up or, but I've come in and really feel at home there. So I have enjoyed it. The whole thing is a learning experience. So at TRA um, and a lot of places, you have, again, records management, you have record retention policies. They were written in the 90s um you, the policies are in the book but without a dedicated records management person they don't get done so you either what you usually end up with is just people have a backlog of things that haven't been processed so um i've come in and i've been very hands-on i said up front i don't know how to do this job sitting at a computer if i can't get out there in the field and see what they have so I can see what it is, I can learn what it is, I can learn what that's what the state calls that thing and the records management, you know, retention schedule. Um, I don't know how to do that. And the other way that I've described my job to other people is if I told you, hey, I need you to clean out your garage before next May, we're gonna come do an inspection, you'd be like, Yeah, okay, I'll get right on that. And then, you know, April will come around. And you'll be like, oh, no, I didn't do the thing. And then you'll haphazardly do it, right? And things will get tossed that shouldn't have gotten tossed or it won't be organized. But if I come to you and say, hey, can I come out next week? We'll order a pizza. We'll hang out. Let's clean the garage together next week. You'd be, you'd be more likely to be like, sure, that's, that's all right. I'll block off time for you to do that. And we have 10 project sites, so I get to be everywhere. And, you know, we're, again, learning how to do this together. I'm not sitting in an office telling people the rules and expecting compliance. I'm, you know, I want to be out there and give them a hand and teach them and, you know, and learn as well. That sounds very interesting. Um, and I, I guess that we already kind of talked about this, but what were some aspects of archival records management um, with your work that kind of stood out to you? I think when you talk about archives and records management, what I have tried to do or what I'm starting to do in this process is put the two together. So again, my job is records administrator. It is not archivist. We don't have an archive, but I've come in and 
realized, again, we've got an organization here that's nearly 70 years old. It's very important, I think. Again, it's government, it's open record. Um, everybody should know the history of you know, your river system, the history of Texas, the history of the water that you're drinking. So preserving that and making that available in the future and, and telling that story, I think is really important. We've got people here that have some really fantastic stories to tell um, that have been around for a long time. And the other thing about that, with to match that with the record side, records people want to throw things away when it's time to throw things away archivists want to keep everything forever so finding that balance so I, again i'm coming in i'm not saying you got to throw it away just because the law says you can it's been five years you can throw this away but hey if you think that's really important we'll keep it i'm not telling you you have you know you don't have to hide it from me right we'll keep it we'll preserve it we'll find that balance between the the disposition of the record side and the historic preservation of the archive side. And uh, um, that's really interesting as well. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's a very important thing as well to keep that balance between, you know, preserving, but then also, you know, keeping things like making sure we're not, you know, hoarding too much, I guess, or along those lines. Yeah. Um, and so the next question here, and to kind of, I guess, go back a bit, you said you mentioned that you conducted some oral history projects. Um, what was that like and how did that impact your career? Okay, so that has been the most fun project that I've gotten to work on so far. Um, again, this is oral history, not in my job description. This is a personal passion of mine, uh, I guess, from being an archive student and understanding the importance of collecting those stories. But when I started at TRA, we have a little bit less than 500 employees. Out of 500 employees, three dozen of them have been there more than 30 years. 12 of them have been more than 40 years. We had two just hit 50. 50 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. um, which is to me just absolutely incredible. I come from a general, you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial. I'm an old millennial, but I'm still a millennial. I don't come from a world where people stay at a job for decades. That's something like my grandparents did, right? You got a job when you got out of school and you worked there forever and then you got a retirement package and you know, that world doesn't exist. Employers aren't loyal, employees aren't loyal. Everybody's trying to fight their way to the top. So to come in and see these people that have been here for 40 and 50 years what what makes you stay you know and we have a company that's still encouraging that we are you know benefits are great tuition reimbursement lots and lots of training lots of professional development and encouragement to go out and participate so we're still trying to do that so one you know i wanted to hear from these guys these men and women um first what made you stay and how are you encouraging the next generation to follow in your footsteps and make this a career? So um, I kind of pitched this idea to my management and upper management. And they're really sure, you know, go for it. If you can find people to do this, we'll, we'll do it. And, um, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to hire a contract. That's the way oral history normally is called up Sam Houston State University in Huntsville. And I called them first because we have um, that's our southern region is down there and I had some upcoming retirements and I reached out to them and said, you know, is there anybody that can give me some suggestions on on how to do this? Um, I have 12 people that have been here more than 40 years. I know I have some upcoming re re, uh, retirements and I want to do something. Um, I didn't take any oral history classes. I've taken lots of archive classes, but not oral history. And um, so I had messaged the librarian there. They emailed me back and said, uh, well, you're messaging right before the semester starts. Professors are really busy. They'll, you know, if you don't hear back from somebody in a month, let me know. We'll, we'll see if we can put you in touch with somebody. I got an email back the next day. I had um, a, hist a public history teacher uh, in the graduate, the graduate history program there who wrote back and said, 
I have this class, a public history class that I always teach in person, but we're doing it online this year. And I don't know what to do for our project. If you're willing to do Zoom interviews instead of in-person interviews, my class can do your interviews. So it's like, all right, let's go. So I matched them up, we got going, we're rolling along. Um, I, I, it's been great. As, as I've gone, as I've gotten to talk to these older folks, and kind of hear their stories, just invite them to participate, even though I didn't do the interviews. Um, I've gotten to know a lot about their heart, about the changes in the technology that they've seen, the just the really interesting things that they've been through over 40 years and what that looks like. So when I initially pitched the project, my pitch was we need to capture these stories before they retire, before it's too late. And so, yeah, I mean, we had um, a retirement party a couple of weeks ago in the southern region. Um, that person had been here over 50 years. It was really, you know, fun. It was exciting. I was like, great. We, you know, introduced the project as a whole out to um, the organization. And so, again, it's all been fun until last week. Last week, um, one of our employees who had been here 50 years passed away on his drive home from work. And the next morning when I showed up to work, I heard, I'm glad you got his story. So suddenly this project means something completely different than it did two weeks ago. You know, it was a joke, get it before it's too late, but now it means something. Now we could send that interview to his family at home and say, listen in his own words, how much he loved his job. Because this is a guy that he always said, yeah, I'm gonna retire. When I started, he said, I'm gonna retire in June. Then he said, I'm gonna retire in November, January, and the last, as of two weeks ago, it was, I'll retire next June, right? Like he loved what he did. Um, again, I don't, I plan to retire one day. I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna live, you know, I don't wanna work for 50 years, but he loved it. He was excited about it. So to have that um, recorded, especially when you think you have more time. I was like, oh, I have plenty of time. I'll talk to him, you know, a dozen times before next June, but you don't know. And we have it, we've got that story. We have it recorded. We share it with his team. We could share it with his family. And it's just this sobering reminder that like time is precious. Um, and it's important. All of our stories are important. Even when you don't, I don't think I have a story yet, but you do, and it's important. Um, and, and we have to capture that because if we don't, nobody else will. Well, and I, I think that's a very important aspect of it too. And thank you, Kelly, for sharing that. Um, I especially know what it's like to be, you know, doing these oral history interviews and then you realize like, you know, you never know right when one person will be there or when they might not be there and it, it's very saddening to hear you know whenever somebody passes away and and then you've got that footage and then it's like okay you know this this is something that's important now and it's very important and so um you know it, it's very you know it's very heartbreaking um so kind of to go on from that like what are some future projects or plans that you have for the TRA? Um. Yes, so we are we are still very much in the first stage of a good functional records management system. Like I said, we have policies, they need to be tweaked. A lot has changed since 1994 um, with, with technology and how you think of things. We have procedures that need to be written. I need new software. Um, we need more, you know, more training, more understanding, you, that kind of thing. We have a lot to do in the records management department, um, which I'm very excited. I'm, again, having a great time. But in addition to that long term, I would like to see um, a functioning archive as well. Uh, right now, like I said, we don't have one of those. So when somebody wants to keep something, they hide it in my office. So my office is already starting to be full of boxes. Um, like I said, when the when the gentleman passed away last week, I showed up to work last Monday and I had boxes in my office from his, which is great. I'm glad they, you know, 
absolutely that means people know that it's important there are people that love this they want to tell that story too so i think long term um i'm definitely more um understanding more of the legal side of records management more oral history more archive um again tell the big picture tell the whole story and so uh, before finishing your master's degree, we're kind of going back a little bit now, but before finishing your master's degree and starting at TRA, um, you were a writer and a WordPress web designer. Were you able to leverage any of that experience when job hunting or what skills did you gain during that period that you feel st you still get to flex in your career? Sure. Um, so I'm going to kind of answer that question maybe a little different. I kind of stumbled into WordPress um, development. Um, my husband at the time was a programmer and we had kind of a small company where we were doing some website stuff. I was the go-between person. I was the person that talked to the clients and tried to figure out the vision that was in their head and then take it back to the computer people that would make it you know, happen on the screen. So as I was doing that liaison, I just started kind of picking up the things as I went and I went, well, I can do that and I can do that. And, and the client would rather talk to me anyway than the computer people. Um, so you just kind of pick it up, pick it up, and then you realize you, I can do this. And anything I don't know how to do, I can Google it faster than I can wait for the programmers to do it. So um, again, I'm not a computer, I'm not a you know programmer by any means, but I can make it happen. And the same thing kind of happened with the, um, with the writing. I started out doing just some social media for people. And then I picked up a um, wellness, a fitness blog, a health blog, um, and then a few things like that. And then I got a contract with a tech startup company. It was a company that helped other startups put content out there for you know to market so i was writing articles based on you know current news i was writing news articles on technology that i did not know at all blockchain cryptocurrency you know location services on your mobile devices you know future and ai those kind of things that that was i had to rely on research and learn enough to at least, you know, I, can't, I couldn't teach it, but I could learn enough to write a little story about it. So again, what I realized as I went is anything that I don't know how to do, we can learn. The resources are out there. If you want to learn how to do it, you can. So I think that going into a new job, you know, again, the, the technology obviously is important regardless of what career you're in. Um, you have to be comfortable using you know, computers and interacting on the internet and knowing how to research. But I think being comfortable with the discomfort of not knowing is also important. Once you can get past that, there's no way to learn every program or every system that's out there. If you get a job, they're gonna use a different software than the other company will. So you don't know that up front, um, but you know you can do it. Um, and I think that that has been the thing that has been the most instrumental in, in going forward is, again, trusting that, okay, if I don't know it now, we'll figure it out. Um, so I can see that you're like a believer in continuing education. You've earned a few certificates. Uh, can you explain how this practice has helped you in your career? Sure. Um, I think with, yeah, I, I think we should always be learning and always be growing and that can look different in a lot of, you know, a lot of different ways. That doesn't necessarily mean racking up a bunch of degrees, although that's fun too. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I could be a career student. I could take all the degrees. That would be fine with me. Um, that doesn't pay the bills. But uh, there are different, you know, as you start to focus in on the things that you're interested in, you know, I did the certificate with the archival management. Um, you know, UNT offers several different kinds of certificates if you want to focus on certain concentrations within your library science degree. When you get into a career, plenty of professional organizations offer a lot of certifications. Um, so the next step for me will be a CRA, which is a certified records analysis. And then after that's a CRM a couple of years down the road. 
Um, so there are different ways to do that. You can take additional classes. You can do just continuing education as far as what your professional organizations um, you know, require. Just stay on top of the change, the trends, the changing technologies in your field. I also think continuing education could be working on yourself. You know, whether that's, you know, courses on improved communication or personality types or, you know, dealing with conflict or, you know, your own emotional health, just whatever you're doing to improve yourself so that you are always growing. Um, I think that can look a lot of different ways. And I think there are a lot of options out there for people that want to continue growing. Um, and to the next question, you've said that in your personal life, uh, you're a ditch everything and save nothing kind of person, um, but that you love other people's stuff and want to find ways to preserve it and that you're passionate about finding and sharing stories behind this stuff. Um, can you give us more insight into what this means for you? Sure. I love that Lisa picked that quote for, <laughs> for the interview she did in the newsletter because like, I don't have, well as I was younger, I don't have a sentimental bone in my body. I just like, my sister must've gotten all those genes. Like she has the most random things and it's all very sweet. I just don't, I, I didn't have that. I just don't have the, I don't need a, an object to connect a memory of an experience to. Um, but a lot of people do. And I realized that Sometimes that physical object is what triggers a memory for someone. Um, and that's when you get the stories. So last time I was over at my grandparents' house, my grandfather is quite the collector. And his house is laid out like almost like a museum. I mean, even some of the things have little labels. Like it was a museum, you know, here's the artifact, you know, here's a gun from 1870, you know, whatever. He's got a label on it. So last time I was there, I just followed him around and said, hey, tell me about that thing. But more importantly about that thing was why that thing? I don't want to know about that thing in particular. I want to know why you picked that thing to put it in your house. And I think we learned, my sister and I learned more in that one afternoon by just saying, hey, tell me about that and tell me about that than, than we did any other time. Just, I mean, instead of sitting down with somebody and say, hey, tell me a story, because I don't have anything to trigger that. So I think as I get older, again, I don't think I'm getting any more sentimental, but <laughs> I think that I am learning to appreciate the meaning that people connect with things. And that's really where the story is. And I think that's the important part that you know, if you can trigger that and get that story from people, that's where the, yeah, the sweet spot is. Well, we have time for one more question. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're nearing the end. Um, so for the last question, can you give some general advice to library science students on transitioning from their programs to a career? Yeah, so, okay, last question, real quick then. Um, three things. Number one, oh, now see if I don't forget them. Now I'm nervous now. Um, number one, broaden your search when you're doing your job searches. Library science is tricky because it can be called a number of different things. You are a person who gets information from point A to point B in a way that point B understands. That can be called a number of different things. So broaden that search out. You might find something that you weren't quite thinking of. Um, number two, trust your ability. Um, imposter syndrome sucks, but you know you can do it. Like if you really, if you really think about it, you can do it. You know you can. So trust what you can do, and apply for the things. So I have heard that um, for entry level positions, if the job requirement says less than five years, apply for it. You know, don't don't look for something that just says entry level. It's not going to say that. Um, I also know that statistically, m men are far more likely than women to apply for jobs that they're not qualified for on paper. Women don't. We're conditioned to follow the rules more than men are. 
and therefore we are less likely to apply for things if we don't check all the boxes. I almost didn't apply for the job that I did because I didn't check the boxes. I didn't have what it said is required, but I applied anyway. And then you have a chance to come in um, and, and share that with people. So yeah, trust yourself, apply anyway. Um, and I guess lastly is just to be enthusiastic. Again, be open-minded, be enthusiastic. Uh, when you apply for something, learn a little bit about the company before you go in for an interview um, so that you know what you're walking into and you can be excited and, and connected when you walk in. Great. Wilma, thank you so much for asking the questions. You did a great job. And uh, I just got my eyes dried from the previous conversation. Sorry. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. I almost I almost didn't tell the story. I'm so glad you did. And you had several comments in the chat related to the to that section of the interview. But I do want to start back from the beginning of the questions that got dropped in the chat while you were talking. Um, the first question is from Julie. She's actually the LISA president. And she wants to know what the name of the archivist group is that you that had helped you find your in, uh, practicum. Yeah, hi Julie. Um, actually, there are a couple of archivist groups. There is a Metroplex Archivist that would be up in this area. I actually posted on Archivist of Central Texas because I didn't know Metroplex Archivist existed and just happened to get a response from there. So, yeah, archivist, yeah, Metroplex Archivist, Archivist of Central Texas was good. Um, bigger um, Archivist Think Tank is a huge global group on Facebook that is just fascinating. You, you know, just information. If you have any questions, there are thousands of people that can help. Okay, great. Did that get your question answered, Julie? So if, if not, you can write another follow up in the chat. Um, the next question is, where do you see your job tra trajectory over the next five or 10 years? I always hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I, you know, I, I think everything that I could have dreamed of initially, um, it's, it's happening and it's happening faster and bigger than I thought it was. I wanted to do one interview. I got 13 done or 12 done in six months. You know, I, the, the, the do an archive part of it, I was hoping to, you know, slip that in, sell that idea a few years down the road, but they jumped on it immediately. Um, new software, I mean, I, I don't have it yet, but like they were open to it immediately. Like, so I have no idea. I have no idea what that's gonna look like. I just know that as long as we keep, you know, keep our enthusiasm up and keep working together, it's gonna grow so much bigger. And I think this is an important question to ask. So although it's difficult to answer, this is probably a question that everybody needs to think about even before they start interviewing, because sometimes these questions come up in interviews like that. You know, where do you see yourself in five years? Um, some of the comments while you were speaking about your colleague who passed away, and we're so sorry for your loss, of course. Um, somebody wrote, what a moving testimony. That's from Adam. And Laura wrote, you're already telling great stories because I think you were, you know, emphasizing the need. Oh, thank <laughs> Are you. Are we going to cry again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then I have another uh, question from the group. Are there any recommendations for the introverts who may want to work in records and archives? Have you come across any introverts in your field? I, I am such an introvert. Like... I'm not, I'm not the shy part anymore, but I'm definitely the introvert part. Um, I think for me, it has been, I'm a little more comfortable if I can put myself in a role. Like I can get up in public speak because you've given me a job to do. I'm an actor, I'm doing the thing. Um, I just have to go home at the end of the day and unwind. When I'm done with this, this is it. I'm not talking to anybody else tonight, right? I love it. I. I really found, especially during COVID, that um, I need to be out. I can't be stuck by myself all the time. So <laughs> um, it was like, no, wait, I need people. I just don't want them around me all the time. So I think it's just, yeah, I, I think even for us introverts, you realize that you need that connection. And I think with archives, it is 
forming those personal connections. I hate the word networking, that scared me, but you know, you go out into the community or I've gone to, I went to a conference um, a couple of months ago anywhere and then you can get to that depth really quick. You don't have to stay superficial. And I think for introverts, we just don't like the superficial part. Mm -hmm. And Laura says she's that kind of introvert too, the kind that you are. <laughs> Okay, and then um, Julie follows up her question. She says, thank you for your answer about the um, archivist group. And she says, you mentioned that your enthusiasm, I hope she can hear me, she's frozen again. And she, uh, you mentioned that your enthusiasm got you your job. What do you think got you the interview? Was it something in your resume or your background? So with your resumes and your cover letters, do, um, tweak them to fit the job that you're applying for, use those keywords. Um, so when I was applying, if I was applying for a university, I was gonna talk a little bit more well, last year about DEI. Um, but if I was applying here at, um, you know, at TRA, I highlighted the Dallas water utility collection that I worked with. So, you know, I was like, oh, here's water, there's water. So think about where those fit um, in order to have that resume kind of stand out. Just tweak a little bit. Um, you don't have to rewrite it the, every time, but try to see how those experiences fit with what they're asking for. Yeah, and that's kind of, uh, everyone kind of thought while you were gone, I asked them to guess and they, they thought maybe it was both your resume and cover letter that you'd prepared them well for, for to get the interview. And of course, these days, sometimes it's a it's AI looking at your resume, isn't it? So if the words don't match, they just get filtered. I've heard that. Um, I don't know how true that is. I do know that um, I did recently, like we don't have that where we are, but I did recently get to help in the hiring process with a, an admin assistant. And we posted a job and had 24 applications in like two days. So it was, it, you know, I had to take good 20, ones. huh? Good ones. Yeah. The good yeah. application. You had to take that and narrow it down to, I mean, nine immediately. And, um, and then take that nine, we made a couple of, you know, made those phone calls and then invited four or five in for an interview. So what made those stand out? I mean, that wasn't specifically archive, archiving or library or anything, but I looked at, you know, is it just a well organized? Is it easy to read because you're scrolling through these fast? Is it formatted well? And I know UNT is great. I think every class I took had a resume writing component and a let's pretend to search for job component. Also, don't forget that UNT now has uh, over the last two years, about the time that I was hired two years ago, the Career Center, had all, all colleges have an embedded career coach. Um, I was just telling them about to also use the Career Center, Kelly. Was the Career Center as big when you were there as it is now? Because now every college has an embedded coach and they have all kinds of activities and... Not that, I mean, I don't know, because again, everything I, that first year was yeah, entirely was virtual, everything. There was no in office, anything. Like I was hoping at some point to do some in-person classes and it just didn't pan out because just everything was online. So I had great advisors. The advisor, the advising department was fantastic. They were very helpful. Um, but as far as getting plugged in, even, you know, even organizations like Lisa here, like that I would have loved to participate. I just, you know, being totally virtual and not being in Denton. I mean, I'm not that far, I'm an hour away, but I just didn't get plugged in the way that, that I could have. So I love that that's out there and that, you know, they're doing more of that. Yeah, and we try to help our students plug in both virtually because many of them are business learners uh, and also in person when they can. So I think instead of tempting fate, we're up about two minutes to the top of the hour. It's been an excellent conversation. I hope you all have enjoyed it. Uh, I really appreciate Wilma, you jumping in and taking over the interview as one of our students. And Kelly, we so appreciate your time spending time with us tonight after a long day of work, probably. And, <laughs> yeah. and a lot of you who were here probably also worked today, you know, or had class. So thank you all for taking your time to be here tonight.